Ladies, I am Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class. We do have a few announcements. I'd like to welcome you. And uh, you see me here, this is not so steady today, so hopefully that's no indication. But <laughs> So y'all pray for steadiness, right? Podium and me as well, amen. All right, so uh, we have a, I think one announcement. You should have received uh, an email or information regarding the BSF 2.0, the pause. Ladies, please prepare for mybsf.org to be down for an upgrade, the pause, November the 22nd through December the 7th. Make plans now to download the lessons you will need. You will need to download your lessons or print the lessons for lessons 10 through 12 during this pause, okay? And then for the lecture, uh, we'll have this on, your, on the PowerPoint for next week. Do know that you can uh, see the lecture through uh, my YouTube channel. You have a link that should have been shared with you and you can also look that YouTube channel up uh, by putting in Sherelle Warren. Okay, ladies, that is it for the announcements. I'm gonna pray and then we'll get started on the lecture. Oh, I do have something else. Someone a couple of weeks ago lost a watch. I think it, I can't read it. Someone told me it's a citizen. Uh, so if this is your watch, please uh, get this from the ALs in the back, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. All right, ladies, I'll pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your timing. Uh, thank you for your provisions, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word and thank you for uh, the clarification that you give us in uh, your word if we are misunderstanding anything about your word, Heavenly Father. And I thank you that your word is true and that it is absolutely true. And so I will um, today be most grateful that, Lord, you are our great sustainer, Lord. I thank you that we are not righteous on our own, but we find our righteousness through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, ladies, in today's passage, Jesus gives us a list of things to do or not to do in order to be righteous. Jesus walks us through how high the standards of righteousness truly are. He shows us that the standards of righteousness is a bar that is set higher than anyone can ever reach. And he shows us that only the transformation he provides is able to empower righteousness in us. What I pray we learn today is Jesus radically transforms believers to obey from the heart. So just to place us in the context of where we are in this passage, Jesus has began his ministry. He has been baptized by John. He has gone through the temptation in the desert and he has begun to heal the sick. Now, this healing of the sick has drawn large crowds to him. People from all over Galilee are coming to him. He is making waves in his community and the people around him. And as there's all this attention on him, he goes up a mountainside to teach. And the portion we're reading is actually part of a longer teaching. And as he teaches, he wants to clarify one thing to his people. And in verse 17 of Matthew chapter five, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It was important for Jesus to clarify that even though he was teaching differently, he was not superseding 
or abolishing God's law. But he was actually fulfilling it. Jesus Christ met all the requirements of the law. His whole life was a fulfillment of prophecy, and he lived out righteousness as it should be. Even though Jesus fulfilled all that was written about him in the Old Testament, that does not mean the Old Testament was no longer important or useful. It was and is still God's word. None of it goes away. And he's addressing the thinking of those around him, giving them a better picture of what truly it means to be righteous. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I will read to you uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 19, verses 19 through 20, the call to true righteousness. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told the disciples to follow and to teach all the commandments. Not only are the commandment, commands and demands of God's law important, they also tell us how God wants us to live because he loves us. Jesus warned that no one would enter the kingdom of heaven unless their righteousness was greater than that of Israel's Pharisees and other teachers of the law. What does this mean? Jesus' listeners would have believed that these righteous leaders were the best at keeping the law. Yet Jesus said that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, a person had to be even more righteous than those men were. This would have seemed impossible to his listeners, and it is impossible for humans to do on our own. Jesus explains that true righteousness goes beyond external behavior to include purity in someone's thoughts and intentions of the heart. Righteousness means being right before God, measured by his perfect standards, not comparison of other similarly flawed people. God in his perfection requires absolute purity of thought, word, and deed. In our sinfulness, we cannot measure up to God's standards of righteousness. God's standards of righteousness should send us to his perfect son for rescue. Jesus provides for us what we can never accomplish for ourselves. God credits believers with his perfection. Jesus' righteousness the Holy Spirit living within each believer produces God-pleasing righteousness. Nothing we can earn, we, nothing we do earns God's favor, favor. Anything we do that pleases God comes from his work within us. So let's make it personal. When I do not believe in God's standards for righteousness, I feel better about my behavior only because I compare myself to others. I try to monitor what I say and do, but never know if I have been good enough. When I believe that I offer God nothing truly, true, truly righteous on my own, I turn to his son and rely on his spirit to transform my heart and mind. The Holy Spirit produces God-pleasing righteousness as I trust. God does not lower his standards of righteousness 
to accomplish our inability to meet them. Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount probes even deeper, making us realize our problem is greater than our behavior. We love and seek the wrong things. Do God's standards of perfection discourage you? How does understanding the, de- the depth of your sinfulness affect you? God has a plan that both meets our great need and upholds his perfect standard of righteousness. We need a savior. Jesus is that savior. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus met God's standards of righteousness. His righteousness becomes ours when we put our faith in him. God does not reveal our sin to discourage us, but to show us we need a savior. Does this lesson increase your gratitude and wonder at God's provision of Jesus as your savior? By his spirit, God works righteousness into our minds and lives. God provides for us and produces in us the righteousness he requires for us. How have you experienced God's transforming work in the way you think and act? In what you desire, all the glory for salvation goes to God. He does it all from start to finish. Our first principle Only Jesus perfectly obeys God and is perfectly righteous. Only Jesus perfectly obeys God and is perfectly righteous. It is not good enough for us to be better than everyone else. The standard required is to be as good as God, who is perfect. One of God's attributes is perfect. But none of us can be perfectly righteous in our, in our words and actions all the time. Only Jesus could perfectly obey God. Only Jesus is fully righteous. Thankfully, for those of us who follow Jesus, God sees his righteousness as ours. We do not have to face the consequences of not being able to be perfectly righteous. How does a clearer understanding of true righteousness give you less confidence in your own ability to be righteous? You know, as Christ begins to change our thinking on what true righteousness is, slowly and slowly, as he raises the bar, we lose more and more confidence in our ability to be righteous. So we're moving from thinking and we're going to something deeper, which is the heart and how the heart is really at the root of the sin that we do. God's law was never meant to only be about our actions. The Jews used the law to know how to act, but God expects more than good behavior. He wants our hearts to be pure as well as our actions. Now, stay with me. After addressing God's commands in general, Jesus spoke about some specific commands. Six times in in this chapter, he said, You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. We will read this command in Chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, 27 through 28, 31 through 32, 33 through 34, 38 through 39, and 43 through 44. Some theologians say these examples of Jesus correcting false interpretation of God's word was to offer a corrective to some misunderstandings. I will read the verses listed to you for each command. The first command that we'll start with is uh, we're going to talk about 
murder and anger. And that is going to be in chapter 5, verses uh, 21 through 26. I will read verse 21 through 22. You can follow along. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. I didn't quite read all of that, but that's the part I needed to stop at. Almost every person would agree that murder is terrible, but Jesus said the sin of murder begins with anger, unforgiveness, and hatred. It is easy to dismiss our thoughts and attitudes as not being important or sinful, but what is inside us determining how we act? In God's eyes, holding a grudge or being bitter or resentful towards another person is always sinful. God knows what's in our heart and our thoughts and motives matter. Jesus taught that God's children need to resolve our fights and issues with others as quickly as possible. If we don't, we are being disobedient to him, no matter who is in the wrong. A person who follows Jesus should make the first move to work out the problem with the other person. If the root of murder is anger, then if there's any unreconciled anger, Christ is saying address that. Consider it as bad as murder and address it as quickly as possible. Next, uh, we're going to cover adultery and lust. Uh, this is covered in chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. I'm going to read to you verses 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The people listening to Jesus knew that adultery was a sin. But Jesus took this issue further as well. He said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus condemned not only the physical act of immoral sex, but also impure sexual thoughts. He wanted purity in our actions as well as in our hearts and minds. Jesus declared that if your eye or hand causes you to sin, it should be removed and thrown away. It is better to go through life disfigured than for the whole body to end up in hell. What did he mean? Did he really want us to cut off our body parts? His point was we must take sexual sin seriously. Do what it takes to avoid temptation and refuse to give in to sin. In a world where sexual freedom is seen as a personal right, Jesus called his followers to be pure in our bodies and our minds. Now we're going to cover divorce, and that's in uh, chapter 5, verses 31 through 32. I will read uh, those verses to you. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. God instructed and excuse me, God instituted marriage as a lifelong commitment between one male and one female. In Jesus' day, much like in many cultures today, divorce was seen as acceptable for almost any reason. But Jesus allowed for divorce only in 
case of adultery. Even then, divorce was not required. Jesus' teachings on divorce emphasize the seriousness of it. People are not to divorce over minor issues. In a world where divorce is common, God's children need to uphold his standards, but also love others well. When a couple divorces, many people get hurt in the process. While divorce is not what God intended for a marriage, we need to show love and compassion for the people who are involved and affected by it. Not all divorced people are responsible for their situation. If you are a victim of divorce, know that Christ cares deeply for you. Those who have been injured by divorce should receive the healing and hope that Christ brings. God's people should reach out to comfort and help those hurt by divorce. We're going to cover oaths, and that's covered in uh, chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. I'll read to you verses 33 through 34. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Jesus talks about oaths or promises in his teaching. Jesus pointed out that someone known for being honest does not need to make a promise. Simply saying what you will do should be enough. Anyone, anything beyond that is unnecessary for an honest person. In verses 37, Jesus says, all you need to say is a simple yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. We'll cover uh, an eye for an eye retaliation, and that's in chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. I'll read to you verses 38 through 39. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist and do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. Did y'all hear that I had to read that again? All right. It's for me first, then for you. Amen. All right, ladies, let's get into it. In the Old Testament law, people were not allowed to punish someone unfairly. For example, if someone knocked your tooth out, you could pull one of their teeth out, but you could not pull their fingernails off. If someone poked you in the eye, you could poke them in the eye, but you could not cut their legs off. The revenge could not be greater than the offense. Instead of responding in violence with violence, God's children are to respond in love. Jesus gave examples that teach that his followers should do the unexpected. When someone hits you on the cheek, offer your other cheek. When someone sues you for your shirt, give them your coat too. However, Jesus did not forbid standing up for injustice or defending yourself under attack or abuse. What was Jesus teaching? Respecting someone else's rights is good, but giving up our personal rights for someone else is better. God calls his children to give up our rights for the greater good in order to glorify him. 
I'm going to uh, cover in uh, verse, let's see, in chapter 5, verses 40, 43 through 47, love for your enemies, but I'll read to you 43 through um, 44. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus' listeners would have known Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. And their culture had added, hate your enemy to this. But Jesus had a different view, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. God's children are to be different from the rest of the world. God's children are to be different than than the rest of the world. As Jesus pointed out, anyone loves the people who love them. If you only love the people who love you, you're just the same as everyone else. God's children are to be different. Be like Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to help us love and pray for people we do not like. And finally, in verse, in chapter 5, verses 48, which is your scripture focus verse, Jesus finished this section of his sermon by saying, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This may sound like a ridiculous command because we obviously cannot be perfect. We cannot always obey everything Jesus just commanded in this passage. So how can we obey this command to be perfect? Even God's children who have the help of the Holy Spirit are unable to always think and act in a way that meets God's measure of perfection. However, perfection is what we should strive for. We trust in the Holy Spirit's help to change our hearts, our minds, so that we are better able to live the way Jesus commanded us to live. It is not in God's nature to lower his standards for us because we are unable to be perfect. He knows we cannot do it, but in his love and compassion, He met the standard for us when he sent Jesus to be our savior. Jesus achieved the perfection that is impossible for us. And when we follow him, his perfect righteousness becomes ours because of his unconditional love and sacrificial death. Our second principle. Only God can radically transform your heart's desire. Only God can radically transform your heart's desire. You might wonder why we should try to think and act perfectly if it is technically impossible for us to do so. And why should we even try to obey God if Jesus' perfection and righteousness becomes ours? Can't we just rely on that and not worry about ourselves? When the Holy Spirit lives inside us, he changes our hearts so we can not only obey God, but so we can also want to obey him. It's not about following Jesus' commands because he wants, he, we want to look good to others and to God. We obey because we love God. God knows we can't be perfect, but he wants us to want to be perfect and to trust in the Holy Spirit to do the work in us. Only God can transform your heart's desires so you can obey him. The commands in this passage are very different than anything Jesus' listeners would have ever heard. Many of the commands would have been confusing for them as they are for us. 
and it is difficult to understand the command for imperfect sinners to be perfect. Many things in the Bible are hard to understand, but God's word is true because the Bible is true. We can trust his word and we can trust his Holy Spirit to transform our hearts. I'll close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, I just thank you that you are uh, giving us the things that we need to live this life, Lord. I thank you that these things were true and it uh, convicted the hearts then and it convicts our hearts now and it is still true. The word of God is true, absolutely true. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.